Tales of the Unexpected. For those of you who are not professional linguists scattered around the room, you need to know one thing. That when you're studying linguistics, you're studying languages, all the languages of the world. You're doing it because you find languages fascinating. It's because you, you want to understand what it means to be human. And the best way of doing that is to study the languages which express the various visions of the world, the various visions of the communities who speak these different languages. And if you're a linguist, that's all there is to it. You simply study these things because they're fascinating. Nobody for one moment ever thinks it's going to be useful. <laughs> that's not what linguists are for. But applied linguists are different characters. <laughs> applied linguists want to be useful. From the very beginning, since they were in their cradles, they have wanted to be useful. And the trouble is, how do you get to be useful? You can't sort of go up to somebody and say, I'm going to be useful to you. Applied linguists on the whole are not proactive. They are reactive. In other words, somebody comes up to them and says, I've got a problem. It's a linguistic problem. Can you help? That's how it's always been with me, and I suspect also for many of the other, maybe all of the other applied linguists in this room. And the trouble is, you never know where and when this problem is going to come from. You never know. In my case, it used always to start with a phone call. These days, usually an email. Probably a, a query on Facebook or something now, or on my Twitter account. Somebody will say, what about this? And suddenly you find yourself going in a direction that you never anticipated. Sometimes the problem is small and you can deal with it very quickly. And say, look, your problem is simply this, and it's over within hours. Sometimes the problem is complex and it takes years. But you never know where the question is going to come from. Back in the 1970s, when Jürgen was just a little lad, I was sitting in my office, minding my own business, doing linguistics, and a phone call arrived from the local hospital, and it is the audiology unit of the local hospital, and the audiologist says, is that the linguistics department? And I say yes, because it was my turn to answer the telephone that day. We were a small department, you know what I And the person at the other end says, look, uh, can I speak to the person who is interested in children's language? Well, that happened to be me. And I said, well, it's me. And they said, well, look, we've got a little girl here. She's three and a half. And she's speaking like a two-year-old. And we've checked her hearing, and it's fine. And we've checked her intelligence, and it's fine. We've checked everything we know how to check, and it's fine. And we still don't know how to treat her. Can you help? I had never seen a language-delayed child in my life. But, you know, what do you do? You say, no, we can't help, bye-bye. <laughs> oh, of course not. I go down to the hospital. I see this little girl, little Jilly, and it's obvious to me what's wrong with her. It's obvious because knowing the stages of language acquisition, I can see where she is and I know where she ought to be, and I know the stages through which normal children pass as they learn the grammar of their language. And so I was able to say, look, if you work with the speech therapist on this particular structure, it should help. Don't work on that particular structure, that's too advanced for her at this stage. They were amazed, they had never heard anything like this before. One had to be careful, always in applied linguistics, you have to be careful because you mustn't assume that the terminology you know will be understood by the people you're trying to help. 
So I couldn't immediately start talking about clauses and, and subjects and verbs and objects and noun phrases and things. They would have been scared and run away. But no. And it worked, of course. The point is that the speech therapist, having tried out these ideas, found that little Jilly was able to respond to them. And over a couple of days, I went down two or three times, and we worked with this little girl, and they were impressed, and they said, um, we've got another little boy like this. <laughs> Do you think you could? That was the beginning of a 50-year project, you see. Over the next 15 years, myself and those colleagues you mentioned devised sets of procedures which were used in clinics now around the world. It developed into a branch of the subject, uh, the branch of applied linguistics called clinical linguistics. Clinical linguistics is now a well-recognized subject. It has its own organization, it has its own journal, it has meetings like yours here. And it all started with that phone call. A few years later, it happened all over again. This time, it was an advertising agency. They ring up and they say, we've got a problem. What's your problem? The problem is this, said the ad agency. That, this is the late 1990s we're talking now. This is pre-Google. Can you remember that far back? <laughs> In the days when there was no Google? In the days when there was no Facebook? a long time ago. But anyway, they bring up and they say, our problem is this. Advertisements are appearing on web pages and we don't want them to be there. They're the wrong sort of advertisement. What do you mean, I ask? And this is what they say. Look, here's an example. There was a CNN page talking about a street stabbing in Chicago. The ads down the side said, buy your knives here. <laughs> Get your knives on eBay. We can sell good quality knives. <laughs> Everybody was embarrassed. Everybody was embarrassed. The CNN was embarrassed because they didn't want that advertisement to be there. The makers of the cutlery were embarrassed because they did not want their knives and forks and spoons to be associated with murder. How do you stop that happening? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Once you think about it for a bit, why is there a problem? The problem is because the stupid software doesn't know enough linguistics. Doesn't know enough semantics, to be precise. It assumes that the word knife, which turns up in the murder report, has the same meaning as the word knife in the context of cutlery and dining. Anybody with any ounce of lexicographical knowledge will know that knife meaning weapon is not the same as knife meaning cutlery. And so what you need to do to sort out this mess is make sure that those two meanings of knife are kept distinct in the software. Now, any word in the language provides you with that ambiguity. Most words in a language are ambiguous. Very few words have just got one meaning, are monocenic, as they say. Most words are polycenic. They have more than one meaning. Very difficult to find a word in English. It must be the same in German, except your words are longer. <laughs> but it must be the same. To find a word in English that has got just one meaning, Handkerchief. You are monosemic. <laughs> I think. Some smart person here will say, I know a second meaning for handkerchief. But on the whole, it's monosemic. But that's very rare. Most words have more than one meaning. And so if you're going to solve this internet problem, you have to analyze all the words in the language to make sure that their meanings are distinct so that the wrong meaning does not turn up on the web page. Another 
15-year project began at that moment. And the one I'm talking about today also starts with a phone call. 2004, the phone rings. It is Tim Pallet, who is a Shakespeare director at Shakespeare's Globe. Now, do you know about Shakespeare's Globe? Shakespeare's Globe is an attempt to reconstruct the Globe Theatre as it was in Shakespeare's time. A new theatre then, 1599, which lasted for over a decade before it burned down because of various problems, and then it was rebuilt later, and so on. But for the last 400 years, it has essentially disappeared. And in the mid-1990s, an American called Sam Wanamaker decided that it was time for a Shakespeare's globe to be reconstructed. As best they could, because there is very little information about exactly what the physical properties of that theatre were. But they did a very good job. And the globe was reconstructed. It began operating on the south bank of the Thames, just opposite St. Paul's Cathedral in 1997. And it's been successfully operating ever since. Now, the globe is committed to performing plays, not just Shakespeare, of course, but performing plays in original practices. And by original practices, they mean original costume, original instruments playing, original music, original theatrical movement. Because if you've not been to the globe, you need to know that there is a big pillar on one side holding up the roof and another big pillar over here, so that wherever you are on the stage, you will not be seen by a certain number of the audience. And so the actors have to move in a very different way around the stage. They are always moving. My son Ben, who is an actor and performed on the Globe stage one year, he told me all about this. How you have to keep going to make sure that the theatre sees you around the, around the pillar, back the other side, and so on. This is all original practices. But they had never gone in for original pronunciation. Original pronunciation. O-P for short. Tim Cowell said, we're thinking of putting on a production in O-P. Can you help? It had never dawned on me that historical phonology could be useful. <laughs> I mean, I love historical phonology. For those of you who don't know the subject, historical phonology, what is phonology? Phonology is the sound system of a language. The sound system of a language. All the vowels and all the consonants and the way they're put together to make syllables and all the intonation and the rhythm and the tone of voice, all of this is part of the phonology of a language. Historical phonology is the study of how this sound system changes over the years. And if you go back to the very beginning, insofar as you can, you study the oldest texts, you look at the spellings to see what information those spellings give you about how the language might have been pronounced at the time. You make various assumptions, you assume that the vocal organs of the Anglo-Saxons were essentially the same as the vocal organs we have today. You assume that the kinds of changes that we know exist today in different accents, the different ways our tongue works, would have been essentially the same as then. We know how we speak now. And so slowly you work it out over a long period of time. And I'm talking now about scholars who have been doing this for 200, over 200 years, and mainly in Germany to begin with, of course. You work out how the language might have sounded in those early days. So as a historical phonologist, I knew those general principles. And in relation to English, I knew roughly how 
English would have sounded in Anglo-Saxon times, in Chaucer's time, in Shakespeare's time, in Johnson's time, and so on to the present day. And it was always fascinating to reflect on this. But that anybody might want to use it in a real life situation was completely outside my comfort zone. <laughs> and here's a man saying, we want to use this. Now those of you in applied linguistics know that when somebody comes along with a problem like this, as I've already mentioned in relation to the clinical world, you have to rethink your subject. You have to think in a different way. You can't assume that the person knows what you know. You have to simplify immediately. You have to start telling half-truths. Because the whole truth is too much. And so in order to start talking sensibly to Tim about this issue, we had to work out a way of putting historical phonology into practice. Why didn't you do this before, I asked him. This is 2004. The globe had been around for, since 1997. Why didn't you do it before? Because, he said, we thought that OP, or original pronunciation for Shakespeare, is 400 years old after all, the pronunciation must have changed so much in 400 years that it would be unintelligible to the audience. And we can't put on plays that are unintelligible. The globe is only open half the year, at least in those days, it's full year now, but it's an open air theatre and so it needs the sun of London, <laughs> which you occasionally get to put on plays. They don't put on plays in the theatre during the winter time. So they need to fill that theatre night after night after night. They get no public subsidy. And so they thought if they put on a play that nobody would understand because the pronunciation was too difficult, audiences would stay away. So they were scared, essentially. What caused you to change your mind, I said to Tim. He said, I gave my board one simple argument. If we don't do it first, Stratford will. <laughs> you do appreciate that the world of theatre, they love each other? No, they hate each other. Well, hate is too strong. They're in competition with each other all the time. They're always saying, what are they doing in that theatre? What are they doing in that theatre? And so the Globe decided that they would be the first to put on an original pronunciation production in London, on the London stage, in 400 years. And they chose Romeo and Juliet in order to do it. It was a late decision. This was January 2004. Romeo and Juliet was to go up four months later. The cast had already been auditioned and selected. The cast had not been told that they, <laughs> <laughs> that they were going to do an original pronunciation version of Romeo and Juliet. They were thinking they were going to do the whole season in modern English, which they did. The whole season was in modern English except for one weekend. That's the point. The drone wasn't putting as we say, all its eggs into the OP basket. <laughs> no, no, they thought, let's just try it out as an experiment and see. So for one weekend only, they did it in OP, and the rest of the time they did it in RP. Modern pronunciation, received pronunciation. The poor actors, of course, had to learn the play twice. Because, as you'll hear in a moment, it's very different. But how different? How different is it? To what extent was Tim's fear right that an audience would not be able to understand it? Well, you can be the judge in a few moments. In order to illustrate OP, 
The strategy is, to begin with, to compare it directly with RP. And for that, I need an RP speaker. Well, a semi-RP speaker, anyway. This is Hilary, ladies and gentlemen. Hilary is as close to an RP speaker as I think you'll find, except she blames me, coming from Wales, to have interfered with her received pronunciation. <laughs> but she does her best. Certainly, it's a better RP than I can ever do, because what you're hearing from me, of course, is a curious mixture of my Welsh background, my Liverpool background, and my being married to Hillary. <laughs> Social linguists call it accommodation. <laughs> what we'll do to begin with is the opening lines of Henry V. Now, the chorus in Henry V comes onto the stage, addresses the audience and says, look, we are going to portray the Battle of Agincourt. What chance have we got? Thus, few actors here. Oh, he says, oh, if only we had inspiration and muse, which would put fire into all of us, so that our invention, our creativity, would really grow, so that would make you, persuade you that King Henry, King Henry, could be like the god of war in his demeanor, the port of Mars, and as a result, maybe all the evil things that are around, like famine and warfare, part of our performance. And this is how he starts, in RP and then OP. Oh, from muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. A kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. A kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Han, like himself, assume the port of Mars. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. Then at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. Now, what's that? that every letter should 
be pronounced. Even the word debt, I don't use some money. Even the word debt, he said, should be pronounced debt. There's a B in the spelling, we must say it, he says. Neighbor should be pronounced nechbor, because there's a GH in the spelling. So some people would have pronounced the H, but most people would not. So this is the first thing to appreciate about OP, is that it isn't just one accent. It is a sound system. And there were many accents of OP at the time. Just as today, I am speaking in a modern English sound system, but there are many modern English accents around this room. It is a phonology we're talking about here, not a phonetics, as it were. Some of the features are really noticeable. The war like Harry, the war like Harry. That W influences the vowel afterwards. And which would you prefer to follow? Somebody who says, come on now, let's go to war, or come on now, let's go to war. <laughs> you follow the second guy, not the first guy. <laughs> authentic. 
Nobody uses the word authentic. Nor does the globe. All you can say is that it is plausible. It is a plausible reconstruction with all the uncertainties that go with it. It's my view on how you put that sound system into practice. Another historical phenologist coming along and doing the same job as I did might make different decisions at various points. But the overall interpretation, I suspect, would be very similar. But how do you know? And for the general audience, one had to explain. How we did this in talk back sessions and articles for the Globe magazine and all this sort of thing. And as you know, then, for those of you who do, but for those of you who don't, there are four kinds of evidence that you look for when you're reconstructing an axis of this kind. The first kind, in no particular order, but the first kind is you look at the rhymes that don't work in modern English, but do work in OP, the rhymes. Let's take Shakespeare's sonnets as an example, all about love. And the word love turns up all the way through. But with what words does the word love rhyme? These are sonnets, and the rhyme scheme is very disciplined, and it was auditory. There were no such things as the modern eye rhymes, the visual rhymes in those days. And love rhymes with prove and move. Well, hello. <laughs> Two explanations. One, Shakespeare was a bad poet and didn't know how to rhyme. Two, the pronunciation has changed. All right, so the second one is obviously the one to go for. As I say, eye lines, visual lines were not fashionable in those days. That's not an explanation. But which way was it? Was love rhyming with pruff? Or does it louvre rhyming with prove? Could be either, couldn't it, really? Do people lengthen the vowel of love to make it long? Elvis did. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> love. Yes, you can lengthen the vowel. Is that how Shakespeare did it? No. How do we know? Now we need to go on to a second kind of evidence. The evidence of the contemporary writers of the time. If anybody writes about their accent of the time, this is invaluable to the historical phenomenologists. And in Shakespeare's time, yes, there are something like 20 monographs of one kind or another, written in the 16th and early 17th centuries, talking about how pronunciation was. The reason was that they were all interested in things like spelling reform. And if you're interested in spelling reform, then one of the things you want to do is work out how the words are pronounced. And they tell you this word is pronounced with a short vowel or a long vowel. Ben Johnson, the dramatist, also wrote an English grammar. And in that grammar, he goes through every letter of the alphabet and says how it is to be pronounced. And when he gets to the letter O, he says, we pronounce this vowel short, as in the following words. And it actually gives us glove, love, prove. Thank you, Ben. That's what I wanted to know. So it was love and prove, not do and prove. Now that is the kind of meticulous analysis you have to do. You have to go through every rhyme, not just in Shakespeare, of course, but in all the other plays of the period in order to establish the first kind of evidence that you need to reconstruct the accent. And then you want to see whether it has dramatic relevance. And it certainly does. Because sometimes the rhymes simply don't work on the stage and you notice it. Take Macbeth. You know that there's a curse on Macbeth, don't you? You know that if you 
say the word Macbeth on stage when you're not actually performing the play, it is always a cause of absolute disaster. Something will happen. Something horrible will happen. And then, sorry. I mean, you can break your leg if you say the word Macbeth. At the beginning, a famous scene of three witches. The thing you have to know about witches in Shakespeare and fairies is that they rhyme. It is part of their identity to rhyme. If you are a fairy, you rhyme. If you are a witch, you rhyme. And at the beginning of Macbeth, we hear these opening lines, do we not? When shall we three meet today? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When shall we three meet again in thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly blow is done, when the battle's lost and won. When the harley barley's done, when the battle's lost or won. Where the face upon the heath, there to meet with Macbeth. <laughs> upon the heath, there to meet with Macbeth. Sorry. You're supposed to be riding witches. Well, yes, indeed they are. What you have to know is you could have been this. Where it says, upon the head, there to be in my bed. Head, my bed. That's the kind of thing that jumps out at you, you see. You notice the rhyme not working. And frequently throughout the canon, you will get examples like this. Sometimes the failure to rhyme goes on and on and on, so it really jars. One of the best examples of this is in the Midsummer Night's Dream. You'll remember the situation where the lovers have gone into the forest and they're all mixed up now, and they don't know who's loving who, <laughs> and the has put juice onto an eye, and the person is now loving the wrong person, it's a horrible mess. At one point, Oberon, the king of the fairies, comes to one of the lovers lying on the ground who's now asleep, and in a special incantation, drops juice into the lover's eyes so that things will be sorted out. He talks about the flower, the purple flower, that Cupid, the god of love, hit with an arrow and turned that flower into a love juice and says essentially in these eight lines that if this love juice works, everything will be fine and when you wake up you'll love the person you're supposed to be loving and all will be well. This is how it sounds in modern English. Remember, Oberon is king of the fairies. He should rhyme perfectly. Flower of this purple dye Hit with Cupid's archery, sink in apple of his eye. Let her shine as gloriously as the Venus of the sky. When thou wakest, if she be by, beg of her for remedy. Yeah, there you have it, you see. Die, archery, I, gloriously, sky, by, Remedy. I D I D I D. It's hard. Isn't it actually? Floor of this purple day, hit with Cupid's archer eye, sink in apple of his eye. Let her shine as glorious day as the Venus of the sky. When thou wakest, if she be by, beg of her. For remedy, remedy, remedy. <laughs> and I've heard that done by, you know, not your amateur hand actor here, but a real actor, and the spine tingles, and you think, oh yeah, this is magical. <laughs> but you don't get the magic if you're going eat by eat by eat by. <laughs> Rhymes are a very important source of evidence. Commentators 
very important source of evidence. Spelling is a very important source of evidence. This, of course, is the heartbeat of historical chronology, the analysis of spellings. It's all we've got, after all. All we've got are the texts with the spelling. So spelling carries an enormous weight, especially in periods when there aren't any commentaries to rely on, like Anglo-Saxon. In the case of Shakespeare, one always checks the spelling variations. The best source of data for this is the Oxford English Dictionary Online, where at the beginning of every word is a compilation of all the spelling variations that exist for that word over time. In fact, it was and what it means is that sometimes a spelling will tell you how the word should be pronounced. Because spelling, you see, was not standardized in those days. Spelling in English, as you will know, many of you did not standardize until the 18th century. I mean, it took 400 years to standardize, but not until the period of Johnson do we get people saying correct spelling versus incorrect spelling. In Shakespeare's time, Spelling reflected all kinds of things, personal idiosyncrasy, typographic, the typesetters, predilections, and the pronunciation. And so when you go to Romeo and Juliet and you hear in the middle that debate between Romeo and Mercutio about having dreams. One says to the other, I had a dream last night, and the other says, Yes, so did I. Tell me your dream. You tell me yours first. And Mercutio tells the story of Queen Mab, the queen of the fairies, who goes at night into people's brains and makes them dream in different ways. And she drives around, he says, in a chariot pulled by the grasshoppers. And the grasshoppers she controls with a whip of film. F-I-L-M in modern English. A whip of film. But in the first folio, and also in the quarto edition of Romeo, it is spelled like this. P-H-I-L-O-M-E. Fill on. It has to be two syllables, you see. It has to be. Fill on. Fill on. A quick of fill on. And it's a plausible pronunciation. How do we know? Because it is still used today. If you know Irish English, for example, you will know that Irish people say, I'm going to the film. I'm going to the film. The film of the That's a common pronunciation. So, perfectly plausible for it to be in Shakespeare. So, spelling is the third kind of evidence. And the fourth kind, of course, are the puns that come to light, the pieces of wordplay which simply are not understood in modern English. There's one in the prologue to Romeo and Juliet. A pun which has been missed over the generations by literary critics and actors and everybody, simply because they're not aware of what is going on in OP. I'll tell you what it is now, and you'll hear the whole prologue in just a moment. In the middle of the prologue, it says, From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. From forth the fatal loins. L-O-I-N-S. What are loins? These are loins. So from forth the fatal loins. After they've had sex, they will have no real like Juliet, he means. A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Loins was pronounced loins. Loins. That oi would have an oi, a schwa beginning. Loins. The word lines, L-I-N-E-S, was pronounced in exactly the same way. Loins. So loins and lines were homophones. They had the same pronunciation. So the line actually means, from forth the fatal genealogical lines and sexual loins, from both of them come Romeo and Juliet. 
And it's a lovely part, it's a lovely piece of work play. And it was never mentioned in any of the notes to Shakespeare editions of Romeo and Juliet until recently, when Remy Vice in his new Harvard edition of Romeo built in OP into his approach to his edition of the play. Well, to end, before we have some questions, I thought it would be useful just to have a, another example of a piece of writing. It's about the, this time not analyze so much, but just let the speech flow over you. Just get a feeling of a longer stretch of old piece, so that you get more familiar with the accent. For those of you who want to follow this up, there are now plenty of resources to enable you to do it. Online, there's the website shakespearespronunciation.com. Pronouncing Shakespeare. Sorry, thank you. Pronouncing Shakespeare.com. There's the website www.originalpronunciation.com. And this is for people who are doing OP in any circumstance. Whether well, not just Shakespeare, of course. There are early music people fascinated by OP, studying Purcell, for example, in OP. Chaucer, of course, and the others. And it's a one-stop shop for that kind of interest. But then, let's just hear the prologue to Romeo and Juliet. Hillary will read the whole thing through, and then I'll do it again. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured pitches overthrows doth with their death bury their parents strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love, and the continuance of their parents' rage, which, but their children's end, naught could remove, is now the two hours' traffic of our stage. The which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. It's a sonnet, of course, and it has to rhyme. Love and remove, turn up again. Do our souls, both a great dignity in fair Roma, where we lay our skin. From air, see on his grudge, rare to new mutiny, where civil blood bears civil hands on the chain. From forth the fair hidden lines of these two foes, a pair of star crossed lovers led their life, whose misadventure piteous overthrows. Doth with their death bury their parents' strength. The fearful passage of their death bark love, and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end not could remove, are now the two hours traffic of our stage. The which, if you with Pesty dares attend, whatever shall miss, or tell. 